In our last video, we introduced the enterobacteria and we looked at the coliforms and non-coliforms. Now, the third group of the enterobacteria that we want to talk about are the true pathogens. These are organisms that we don't have any good relationships with. They aren't opportunistic pathogens. Uh, and so if they are in us, uh, particularly in our gut, they are very likely causing disease or attempting to cause disease. Sometimes these are called professional pathogens. The three most important genera of true pathogenic enterics are Shigella, Salmonella, and Yersinia. Now on the picture on the right, you've got a, an image of Shigella, and we'll talk about Shigella and Salmonella here. I'm not going to take the time to talk about Yersinia, but if you look at that picture in the bottom left, uh, what does that remind you of? What do you think Yersinia causes? Exactly, bubonic plague. <clears throat> Believe it or not, plague is still around. Um, it's much more readily tracked and controlled nowadays. And uh, here in San Diego, at least, it doesn't seem to be carried by rats or fleas on rats. It seems to be um, a squirrel issue. And about once a year or so, uh, there's a notice that uh, the, the county Department of Public Health has found a squirrel or two that's positive for plague. And every few years, uh, a person is positive for plague. But it's nothing like the old days, like you can see in the bottom left. On the bottom right, you see I've got a picture of a syringe. Uh, I don't know why it has a $100 bill in it. I guess that's just what I found online that I could steal. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the characterizing factors of these true pathogenic enteric, enterics is that they have something called a type 3 secretion system. Type 3 secretion system is a, a multi-protein structure that's sometimes called a needle apparatus because what it does is it forms um, a, a needle essentially on the cell surface. It actually forms dozens or hundreds of them on the cell surface, it can find the surface of a eukaryotic cell to infect and then literally puncture itself all the way across the cell membrane of that eukaryotic cell. Then when it produces toxins, it can pump them directly from its cytoplasm into the cytoplasm of your cells and my cells. There's no need to secrete it and wait for diffusion and other processes to move it around when it's gonna eventually get to our tissues we, they literally inject our cells with them. <clears throat> All three of these, Shigella, Salmonella, Yersinia, use type 3 secretion. Some E. coli strains use type 3 secretion systems, some, um, and then some others. Uh, there are a few others that can use this. So it's not just unique to these three, um, but these three uh, genera do, in fact, use type 3 secretion systems, which make, that makes them particularly virulent. Shigellosis is a form of gastroenteritis, okay, sometimes call, called uh, stomach flu, right? We're, and we all agreed we're, we're ditching that, that confusing terminology. There are four different known species of Shigella that can cause gastroenteritis. Shigella dysenteriae, Shigella flexneri, Shigella voidii, and Shigella sonii. Any of these can cause gastroenteritis. Shigella gastroenteritis is often referred to as dysentery or bacillary dysentery is an old term that still uh, comes up often. Fever cramps, diarrhea, bloody stool, typically not a watery stool. Watery stool is more often going to be uh, an E. coli infection. But Shigella um, does in fact have that telltale bloody stool. Now I should mention that blood in the stool doesn't look red like you'd expect. Blood in the stool tends to turn black as the hemoglobin gets processed moving through the intestinal tract. So when your patient tells you, uh, when you ask, hey, have you had any blood in the stool? And they say, no, but it's really black and mucousy. Okay, well, there you go. There's, there's the bloody stool we're looking for. And so now you can, you can narrow it down often to Shigella or E. coli, though not completely. There's more information you're going to have to get. Shigellosis is typically self-limiting in five to seven days, though if you catch it early enough, um, and if you're ready, you can get on antibiotics, and uh, it, it can um, respond to those antibiotics. ID50 value pretty low again, between 10 and 200. Uh, it's a, a really small dose, much like the E. Hecky coli that we talked about in the last video. Another little clue for you is that shigellosis is often aggravated by anti-motility drugs, things that slow down the movement in the lower intestinal tract, like Imodium. So if your patient comes in and is describing all these things, you've got fever, cramps, diarrhea, bloody stool, Maybe there's some questionable food source involved. And they say, yeah, you know, I, I was taking Imodium for the last couple of days and it just it isn't getting better. In fact, I think it might even be getting worse. All right, you say, aha, don't just brush that off. Make a note of that because shigellosis uh, is known to 
respond that way to antivirals. <clears throat> now, salmonella can cause two different diseases, salmonellosis and typhoid fever. So let's talk about salmonella in general, and then we'll talk about those two types of, of illnesses. There are multiple species out in circulation. Uh, well, how do I say this? There are multiple names for salmonella species. It's very likely they are all the same species, just different strains, different serotypes. <clears throat> One textbook might call all of them Salmonella enterica, whereas another might call them all Salmonella anatum, okay, or enterotitis. Um, understand that it's likely that all of these Salmonella that make us sick are all the same species, and the difference is at the strain level, a finer distinction. <clears throat> and so, the name after, the word after salmonella um, is often not italicized and, and often capitalized. We call that the serotype or the serovar, right? serum variety. And so we're going to notice things like enterica, enterotitis, anatom, typhi, paratyphi, and so on. These are, of course, gram-negative enteric bacilli, not part of our normal flora. These are our professional pathogens. But most other vertebrates do seem to carry them. Uh, asymptomatically and so the poop of other animals uh, is a great vector for spreading them around getting them into our food supply and so on they have a variety of toxins that are, are um, possibly on their list for any given strain there's an enterotoxin makes sense it's going to attack the gas the uh, uh, intestinal lining and then there's a long series of exotoxins and these exotoxins can go after really specific structures in our cells like your mitochondria they have exotoxins that attack your phagocytes, exotoxins that degrade your cytoskeleton so they can invade deeper and more easily into your cells. Some of them induce apoptosis or programmed cell death in order to get the cell to burst and release its goodies from the inside. <clears throat> Salmonellosis is going to rely heavily on the enterotoxin and not very much on the exotoxins. Okay, Salmonellosis is the food poison. Typhoid fever, on the other hand, uh, is a, a bit more serious. The serotypes typhi and paratyphi can cause typhoid fever. Let me just make a little clarification here. We talked about rickettsia. Okay, this is an organism we talked about earlier in the semester. If you don't know anything about rickettsia, go back and reread what we talked about there. Rickettsia, I said, I want you to make sure you guys understand it does not cause rickets. Rickets is a vitamin deficiency of some sort. Typhus is the name of the group of diseases that the rickettsias cause. Typhus and typhoid fever are not related. Typhoid means sort of kind of like typhus because they share some things in terms of their signs and symptoms. Otherwise, they're completely different. These organisms are, are highly unrelated to one another. So keep some of these terms in mind, right? Rickettsia causes typhus. Typhoid fever is caused by uh, salmonella typhi or salmonella paratyphi. And rickets has nothing to do with microbiology or maggots. It's, it's a nutrition issue. So how are these strains passed around? Well, it's a fecal-oral route of transmission, but there's a vehicle intermediate of food or water. <clears throat> and so they're going to get from you know, feces of one person into food or water and into the mouth of the next. The ID50 value is moderate. 1,000 to 10,000 cells is what it takes to cause disease. They can cause bacteremia, if you get in the bloodstream, they can infect organs. Of course, they can cause gastroenteritis. All gram negatives have endotoxin, but for some reason, some rely more heavily on endotoxin for their pathogenesis than others. This is an example where endotoxins play, uh, endotoxin plays a big role in the disease progress. Some of the symptoms, fever, headache, muscle pain, malaise, loss of appetite. Mortality rate is high, as high as one in three if it goes untreated. If it's treated, uh, it tends to still be res uh, responsive to antibiotics, so we're seeing an increase in resistance there. And in regions of the world where this is endemic, meaning it's common and uh, in circulation very commonly, there is a vaccine available against typhoid fever. <clears throat> now the gastroenteritis, the salmonella food poisoning, is going to be caused by enterotitis, so salmonella enterotitis, that's a seer of our name, or salmonella typhimurium. Now, again, we've got another typhi kind of word in there. Typhimurium does not cause typhoid fever in us. Um, murium refers to mouse. And so in a mouse, it causes typhoid fever. In you and me, it causes gastroenteritis. 
contaminated chicken and eggs, other meats, contaminated vegetables. We see salmonella and the ID50 value is pretty high though. You're back up there with uh, like what we see with uh, the ETEC type E. coli is around a billion cells. So it takes a lot of salmonella enteritis or typhimuria to cause gastroenteritis. Fever, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, sometimes vomiting, I guess, if you're lucky. Self-limiting within a week, um, not typically responsive to antibiotics. And it may be that by the time we know what it is, it's so late that they've moved on to a, a, a growth phase that's not responding to the antibiotics or your immune system is already winning, or it may actually be that the bacteria themselves don't respond well to the antibiotics. <clears throat> so those are two examples of true pathogenic enterics, the Shigella and the Salmonella. Yersinia causes plague, and we're not going to get into Yersinia, but I hope that that was a good introduction for you.